Welcome back. All right, time for yet another new series. Earlier today, I started a new series on reversible computing. I want to start a new series as well on FPGA programming. Um, FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays. Like the series on reversible computing, this is going to be a series where I have a little bit of knowledge, but what I want to do is you know, sort of far outside or far beyond uh, my current state of knowledge. In particular with these FPGAs, which are programmable hardware, I want to be able to do things like try to create a scheme machine or scheme chip or scheme accelerator and also a mini Canron chip or mini Canron accelerator or relational programming processor. I also would like to explore the ideas of reversible computing at the FPGA level. That doesn't mean that uh, a, a, a reversible FPGA you know, processor or abstract machine or whatever implemented you know, on this sort of hardware would actually be physically reversible and have low entropy and dissipate small amounts of energy, um, or small you know, amounts of, generate small amounts of heat. Um, I wouldn't expect any of that to be true, but could hopefully create something that's logically reversible. I do know that there are abstract machines uh, that people have developed for reversible computing, so could maybe play around with that in FPGA. And also, it just seems interesting and fun. I've, I've done a little bit with FPGAs in the past. I took a course at Indiana University on computer architecture where we actually designed like a PDP-8, I think it was, um, that ran on, on, on some sort of FPGA. So I've done a small amount of FPGA programming. <clears throat> so I have a, a board with me. Let's see, let's see if I can zoom in on that a little bit more. All right. Lattice Semiconductor ICE-40 HX 8K breakout board. And you can see the number, all that. Okay, we got various pins and so forth. Uh, some headers soldered on on the left and different places to put jumpers and headers on the right. And here's the, the FPGA itself. Um, yeah. So it's got a USB connector and you can hook it up to a laptop or a computer and it's got some LEDs, that kind of thing. All right, so it's a simple breakout board. There's a, a reason I chose this particular model. You can see this is, you know, in front of my new trackpad, uh, sitting on top of Montaigne. I hope Montaigne would approve because <clears throat> the whole reason for this setup is so I can try to write more. So as a writer, I hope he would have approved of my use of using him, his writings as a riser. Anyway, um, well, that's the, the FPGA I have. And the reason that I'm going with this particular FPGA, at least for right now, is that this ICE uh, family low power FPGAs uh, from Lattice Semiconductor <clears throat> has one really nice feature. And the feature is they're open source <clears throat> um, software, this open source software for programming this this uh, type of FPGA. And in particular, the bitstream format uh, is, is understood. So um, I'm not exactly sure of the whole history for this, but there's software uh, under this name Project Ice Storm. There's an entire tool chain with this Yasis uh, Verilog synthesis front end and Arachne PNR place and route and bitstream generation and ice pack. There's a whole tool chain for taking Verilog code and generating a bitstream, which is like the, the actual binary special format that the FPGA can understand. Um, so there's an open source version of the entire tool chain. That's very rare for most FPGAs. 
the companies that make the FPGAs, you keep all that stuff proprietary and secret, and you have to to get their software, which often under you know only runs under Windows or is uh, really is not very good unless you spend a huge amount of money for you know the five thousand dollar a seat version or the fifty thousand dollar a seat version or whatever it is. Um, so I don't want to deal with that, and also a lot of the GUI builder stuff I've tried with the FPGAs I hated. So just want to program textually in Verilog. So that's the reason I got that particular type of uh, chip. There are other breakout boards for this ICE family, um, but that's that's the main reason. So I can you know, plug the breakout board into my laptop. I can get a complete open source tool chain and program it using, you know, using all open source software. Um, there are a couple disadvantages of this. One is, you know, the software is, I don't think, up to date with the latest uh, commercial offerings, let's say. I think they're quite far from it. Another issue is that these are pretty low-powered FPGAs. So um, they're really expensive FPGAs you can get that are very fast and have a huge number of of uh, the sort of the equivalent of logic gates on the chips. Um, so these these ice low power uh, processors or FPGAs are are much more modest in their capabilities. So um, you know if you were trying to do something really pushing the state of the art of a FPGA design, you know probably you wouldn't want to use one of these low power ices. But you know for what what I want to learn, just trying to get up to speed learning Verilog and all that. I think it's it's probably a good good way to go. Um, <clears throat> the various resources that I'm interested in, in learning Verilog and uh, Verilog programming and simulation, there's this interesting website, 8-Bit Workshop, which I've talked about before. And uh, there are these pretty nice books. Uh, they're not perfect, but I think they capture sort of like critical information on making games for the Atari 2600 and uh, for the Nintendo Entertainment System, making 8-bit arcade games in C. Then there's one on designing video game hardware in Verilog. Um, so you can you can deal with, uh, you know, kind of like the late 70s era hardware or maybe early 80s cabinet arcade games in Verilog, you know, make your own games. And one nice thing about this series of books is that there's this 8-bit workshop IDE where you can actually, you know, run the code in a simulator. So there's like Atari 2600 games, that kind of thing. Um, but there's also Verilog. So there's Verilog simulator. And let's see if it loads. There we go. And then there are different uh, programs that we can see, like there's... You know, there are games like a tank game. And, you know, you can see that there's a screen and all those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, there are also just kind of more primitive things like clock dividers. And you can see that there's this virtual oscilloscope where you can see the traces and um, those sorts of things. So, you know, one of the things I was thinking is like, well, at least for simple things, um, could try running the Verilog in this 8-bit workshop IDE just to make it simple. You know, like I said, these tool chains are kind of annoying, so I would like to run things on the physical hardware. However, if I'm just getting up to speed on Verilog, mm, you know, I, I don't know I want to get distracted up front with trying to get it to run on the physical machine when, you know, first of all, I don't have an oscilloscope with me right this second. You know, the virtual oscilloscope is probably a good place to start. Um, oh yeah, so this is like the Japanese website had another version of the breakout board, slightly different markets. I mean, markings, another, another approach besides using that game, uh, book, the game programming book and something I'm very interested in is, uh, you know, related to this post on Lambda the Ultimate about a tiny computer, an unpublished memo by Chuck Thacker. 
who is uh, famous for working on the design of the you know Xerox Park Alto. Okay, he's like the main hardware designer for that. And uh, this is interesting. So you know, Alan K recently posted the following problem or posed the following problem. I'd like to show junior high school and high school kids the simplest non-tricky architecture in which simple gates and flip-flops manifest a programmable computer. Alan posed a couple of other desiderata, primarily that the computer needs to demonstrate fundamental principles, but should be capable of running real programs produced by a compiler. This introduces some tension in the design since simplicity and performance sometimes are in conflict. This sounds like an interesting challenge and I have a proposed design. Now, the link from the Lambda the Ultimate uh, post seems to be dead. However, if you do a search for, for that article, um, you'll see that there are uh, links to this. So, you know, here's, here's one. Um, University of Cambridge had a teaching assignment based on this and has has the document. So this is from 2007. Um, yeah, so I think this document is pretty short. It's like eight pages long, and at the very end is uh, some Verilog, okay? And here's the Verilog description. Um, that's pretty cool. All right. So, I have the document here. So what I'd like to do is go through this document and then, you know, try to try to understand what the Verilog is doing. Try to understand this architecture and see if we can get it running um, both in the 8-bit workshop IDE and also on my uh, little FPGA. And if that works, then, you know, maybe write a little compiler uh, for it. And, you know, the, 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 the real goal, in addition to just learning more about Verilog and FPGAs and all that and computer architecture, is that I would like to start thinking about how would you build a scheme machine. There has been a scheme processor in the past. And, of course, there were Lisp machines. Um, so I would like to think about scheme machines and play around with that a little bit. And then the other thing is like, well, a mini Canron machine. And then, of course, the reversible computing hardware. So those are some projects that I've wanted to do for a long time. You know, Alan K. famously said that um, people who care about, you know, who really care about software should care about hardware or should build their own hardware, I think it was. Um, so, you know, what would happen? And, you know, I think the iPhone's a good example of that and Apple Vision Pro, Um you know, there, there are just certain things that if if you want capabilities, you actually have to have special hardware. Now, of course, in computing, we have a universal computer, and you can think of Turing machines being equivalent to Lambda Calculus and all that. So in some sense, theoretically, it's the same, but in practice, it's not. Um, you know, so, you know, it does matter. Performance matters, and you know, parallelism matters and, you know, like exploring a mini Canron implementation that could do parallel unification. That might be interesting. I don't know. Okay. Alrighty. So let's just go through it. We're going to do our standard thing. It's only eight pages long. I'm going to read it page by page. We're not going to get the whole th thing today. Uh, you know, maybe get a page or two in and, uh, you know, come back to it. So a new series. So you know, we're going to do a little bite bite size, a little bit of a time, you know, partly just so I can change things up and I don't, don't get stuck in, uh, down one rabbit hole, you know, why not do many rabbit holes? Here we go. A tiny computer, Chuck Thacker, MSR, 3 September, 2007. Alan Kay recently posed the following problem. I'd like to show junior high school and high school kids the simplest non-tricky architecture in which simple gates and flip-flops manifest a programmable computer. Alan posed a couple of other desiderata, 
primarily that the computer needs to demonstrate fundamental principles, but should be capable of running real programs produced by a compiler. This introduces some tension into the design since simplicity and performance sometimes are in conflict. This sounded like an interesting challenge, and I have a proposed design. The machine is a Harvard architecture, separate data and instruction memory, RISC, which stands for Redu Reduced Instruction Set Complexity. Okay, so separate data and instruction memory, two types of memory. It executes each instruction in two phases, cars corresponding to instruction access and register access and ALU transit. <clears throat> okay, that sentence is a little hard to parse, since, especially since that's a grammatical error. So, so I guess there's each instruction when executed has two phases. The first phase, I guess, is instruction access and register access. Okay, I guess that's one phase. Instruction access, I guess that's reading the next instruction pointed at from the program counter, that's what I'm guessing. And register access, because if we're doing an ad that is reading from two registers, that has to happen. And ALU transit. Okay, I'm not sure what transit means. I guess the air, the sending the bits to the arithmetic logic unit and the logical or arithmetic operations happening. Registers are written at the end of the instruction. Okay, I guess, is that part of the ALU transit then, that part of the second phase? Figure one is a block diagram of the machine. <clears throat> okay, so we already have some terms here, like risk, you may have heard of, redu reduce instruction set computing, ALU is arithmetic logic unit. If you know about those things, fine. If you're not familiar with those concepts, you might want to look at just a, you know, some some reference on on hardware. Uh, one thing that you could look at is um, Charles Petzl's uh, book Code. Um, that's a pretty good self-contained book that talks about the basics of hardware and um, you know sort of brings you up to basic ideas of things like arithmetic logic units. All right. So for this one, I'm going to assume you know about some of those things. Um, if if people want, I could make some videos where I talk about that a little bit. It's not like I'm some super expert on it, but you know I know what an ALU is. I know what risk is. Of course, people debate what risk is. So, um, all right. So we have a block diagram of the machine. Let us zoom in. Well, actually, let us zoom out first. Okay. Figure one that the Tiniest computer, okay, tiniest. Tiniest computer question mark. All right, so that's the whole computer. All right, at the at the high level, right select, registers, 128 32-bit registers, it looks like. Uh, here's an ALU. Here's data memory, 1,000, uh, 1 kilobyte, or 1,024, I guess, 32-bit. Um, words, instruction memory, same size, PC select, program counter, add one, add two. Okay, so I'm, I'm guessing that the size of the instructions are such that adding one or two to the program counter is going to be very common. That's maybe what's going on there. Um, I'm a little confused as to what that is. Skip test. Uh, do skip. Well, I have no idea what that means. All right. And uh, so let's see. Right select. Okay. The registers. All right. So this is um, some sort of multiplexer, I guess, that's going to select which, uh, you know, when we're writing uh, to the registers, like what, what, which of the inputs actually gets into a register. Uh, w address, A address, B address. Okay. Not exactly sure. W might be right. I don't know what A and B are. 
okay, it looks like there are three clocks. Is this phase zero, phase one, phase phase one? Okay, there, there are two phases for the clock. Okay, phase one. Oh, so phase zero and phase one. All right. Uh, a out and B out. So I'm not sure what these A and Bs are. Maybe they're two uh, two main registers. Is there anything two register? I don't know. All the instructions. Okay. Uh, the AOU. I'm guessing C is a carry flag and N is a negative flag for things like addition. So we have add, subtract, logical operations, uh, cycle. I don't know what cycle means. Cycle, is it like clock cycle or is this like a arithmetic shift? I'm not sure. And then this is some sort of bit slice thing. I am nine to seven. So when you see something like nine colon seven, my understanding is there's some sort of input line um, or bus that has multiple bits or multiple wires. And here we're seeing a slice for like a, um, wire nine through wire seven and wire six through wire five. Those are different inputs there. I think these are inputs. They're either inputs or outputs. I don't see an arrow. So I'm a little, uh, not sure where those connect, uh, where I am. Okay, so there's some stuff I don't understand, obviously. Some stuff I do understand. So it looks like, you know, phase zero, phase one. It looks like a read clock and write clock. That's what I'm guessing what those stand for. Read, write, address. Uh, write, I don't know what WD is. Write address, uh... Write address, read address. Okay, instruction memory. Yeah. PC multiplexer down here, PC mux. All right. Well, that's supposedly the block diagram for the entire computer. Some of these things I don't understand. You know, let's just like a little more. So in data, I guess that's input data. So there's 32 bits, so zero through 31 inclusive. These are, there's the ALU bus. <clears throat> Uh, zero in PC increment, I think that is. I think that's a PC increment. Increment the program counter to point to the next instruction. Uh, I don't know what DM is. Is that like direct memory or data data memory? That must be data memory because we have data memory separate from instruction memory. Okay, so IM is instruction memory. DM is data memory. Okay, so when I was confused about about the IM before, that's the instruction memory. Okay, uh, that's interesting. Okay, so these slices, uh, yeah, so I guess these are parts of the instruction. Um, okay, so there's some instruction format that we'll have to learn about. And then here are other bits of instruction memory. Okay, great. Okay, so there's uh, the data memory and the instruction memory. Okay, so we're seeing different parts of different uh, buses. Load constant, load. I don't know what in means. Uh, do a jump, all right. Mm -hmm -hmm. Okay, well, I've got a little bit of a sense of what's going on with these things, but... Um, some of my details are, some of the details are unclear. All right, let's go a little further. Discussion and implementation. Although it is impractical today to build a working computer with a, quote, handful of gates and flip-flops, which is, I guess, what Alan was asking for, it seemed quite reasonable to implement it with an FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. Modern FPGAs have enormous amounts of logic, as well as a number of specialized hard macros, such as RAMs, okay, random access memory. So they're, yeah, the, I guess, uh, you know, on a, on a modern FPGA, 
you know, you can get Verilog code or VHDL code that represents things like random access memory and will allocate part of the FPGA um, logic to random access memory. So those are kind of standard things, hard macros, I guess, uh, you know, it's what he's calling it. So, you know, you don't have to write that from scratch. You can decide what size you want. Okay. Xilinx, as a big manufacturer of FPGAs, sells evaluation boards for about $150 that includes an FPGA and some auxiliary components for connecting the chip to real-world devices and the PC that runs the design tools, which are free to experimenters. This was the approach I took. Okay, so my my uh, FPGA is not Xilinx, and uh, it is not it doesn't have a, a enormous amounts of logic uh, compared to the cutting edge ones. But you know, this is also from two thousand seven. Um, you know, when hardware advances, uh, I don't remember exactly how much my board costs. I don't think it costs this much. I think it costs a little less for the evaluation board. Um, not sure. But I know you can get some ice, uh, you know, these ice processors on like a little stick, like a thumb stick thing for, for cheap, you know, quite cheap, like 20 bucks or something. I don't remember. Um, so you can, you can get small ones to play around with, with the open source software. Although the machine was designed primarily for teaching, it may have other uses. It is small, fast, and has 32-bit instructions. This may make it competitive with more complex FPGA CPUs. The later section on extensions describes some possibilities for making it a real computer, albeit one without multiply, divide, floating point arithmetic, or virtual memory. So this is similar to the sorts of processors I had access to as a kid growing up, you know, like uh, 6502s, um, or even more primitive processors where, you know, you want to do a divide, ha, 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 good, good luck with all that. Um, all right. So this is a, a Spartan processor. It really is reduced instruction set complexity and not just complexity, just the instruction set has almost nothing in it, uh, in terms of, of arithmetic, but that's fine. I chose a Harvard architecture. And that's with the separate data and instruction memory. Because in this arrangement, it is possible to access the data and instruction memory simultaneously. Ah, okay. So in the same clock cycle or whatever, the same phase, we can get access to both. It is still possible to write self-modifying code, although this is usually considered a bad idea, since stores into both memories are supported. Okay, so if you want the program to, to manipulate its own instructions and change, you know, the code of the program to change its own code while it's running, which used to be a completely standard technique and in fact necessary, nowadays, like, no, you shouldn't be doing that. In fact, a lot of times the code will be uh, read-only in maybe a modern operating system for security reasons. But you're allowed, you know, you, you could do that if you wanted to with this FPGA uh, design, this processor design, I should say. Because it is implemented in the latest generation semiconductor uh, technology, 65 nanometer, well, that's not the latest anymore. Uh, I don't know what it is for FPGAs, but now they're, you know, talking about three nanometer and five nanometer, whatever those mean, the largely marketing terms for, you know, things like Intel or ARM chips. I don't know uh, what the latest technology is for FPGA. I think it lags behind a little bit, um, but I'm sure it's much smaller than 65 nanometer at this point. The design uses a Xilinx Vertex 5 device. All right. This part has an interesting feature that contributes to the small size of the overall design, a dual-ported static RAM with 1,024 words of 36 bits. Interesting, 36-bit word. A dual-ported static RAM. Mm. So what, okay, so it's 36 bits 
but this is a uh, 32-bit architecture for what are those four bits for? Are these like tag bits or something? I'm a little confused. I'm not sure exactly what dual ported mean. Um, static RAM versus dynamic RAM. So this is RAM that doesn't have to be refreshed dynamically is my understanding. That's the difference. Um, all right, so some of this stuff I just don't understand. One thing I have learned is if you uh, if you ask, you know, say chat GPT about some of these things, uh, it can usually give you a pretty good explanation. So uh, maybe some of this will be explained later, but some of this I might have to look up or ask chat GPT, which see if it actually comes up with something realistic. This RAM is used for the data and instruction memories, and two of them are used to provide the triple ported register file. So I'm not sure what this means, dual ported, triple ported. I guess it's some sort of input and output port, or it has to do with the buses. I'm a little confused uh, what's going on, the triple ported, dual ported static RAM. Let's go back and look at this diagram. <clears throat> Okay, so here's the register file. I don't know why they call it a file, but these are the registers. Okay, triple ported. Um, well, here are three buses, it looks like. I don't think it's the clock that they're talking about. The, is that the triple port? These three things? The right address, the A address, and the B address. I don't know. I don't know if that's right or not. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's what he means by triple ported. I'm confused. All right. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I was thinking about is, you know, I don't know how big a Vertex Five is compared to the ICE. Uh, you know whatever model this is, the uh, ICE 40 H X 8K. Um, so it could be that the Xilinx has more logic on it and that we're going to have trouble fitting all this, uh, all the logic onto this, uh, the ICE, I'm not sure. Might have to size down the design a little bit. Um, or maybe, maybe it fits fine, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure at what scale the simulator for the 8-bit workshop, you know, starts falling over. But, you know, we'll play around with it, figure it out. All right. Um, so somehow we, we're going to have some RAM uh, for, for the instruction memory and the data memory. The machine has 32-bit data paths. Most tiny computers are eight or 16 bits wide, but they were designed originally in an era in which silicon was very expensive and package pins were scarce. Today, neither consideration applies. We will implement a variant of the machine with 36-bit data paths. Okay, so that's the, the variant, I guess. All right, so why 36-bit? Is it just to get the... Mm, why 36? So it's not a 36-bit address space. Uh, so it's not about the address. And, and, you know, I don't know. I don't know why 36-bit. I guess uh, if you want to do a list machine, you know, you could have two 18-bit um, uh, pointers or something for a car, car and... Cutter. The design on the instruction set for the machine was determined primarily by the instruction and data path widths. It is a risk design since that seemed to be the simplest arrangement from a conceptual standpoint, and it is important to be able to explain the operation clearly. Although the memories are wide, they are relatively small, containing only 1k locations. Okay, great. The section on extensions discusses some ways to get around this limit. For pedagogical purposes and for the immediate uses we envision, a small memory seems adequate. The memory is word addressed and all transfers involve 
four full words. Okay, so I think the words are 32-bit, right? Well, unless there's some weird, the 36-bit stuff. Um, but, uh, okay, all transfers involve full words. Byte addressing is a complexity that was introduced into computers for a number of reasons that are less relevant today than they were 30 years ago. This is very limited. There is very limited support for byte oriented operations. Okay, so we're doing word oriented things. Forget about bytes. Who cares about eight bits? That's old school. One thing that is quite different, even from modern machines, is that the number of registers directly accessible to the program is 128. Oh, that's a lot of registers. This number was chosen because the three register addresses fit comfortably into a 32-bit instruction. The value of this many registers may seem questionable, but given the implementation technology, they are extremely cheap. This was not the case when most computers in use today were designed. In addition, there is no significant performance advantage in using fewer registers. The instruction and data memories can be accessed in a single cycle and so can the register cycle of the file. A register file of 128 words only uses one eighth of the block RAM on that particular FPGA that implements it. Um, or, or this is the block RAM in general. Okay, for for that size, I guess. All right. The extension section discusses ways in which the remaining registers might be used. It might be argued that a compiler cannot effectively use this many registers. That was certainly true for a compiler designed in an era in which registers were expensive and much faster than the main store. This is not the case here, and it will be interesting to see whether a compiler that uses whole program analysis can actually use this many registers. If they turn out to be unnecessary, it is easy to reduce the number of registers. Okay, it's nice having that many registers. The only discrete register in the design is the program counter. I guess this is like the only restricted uh, register. PC, is, or sorry, is, is the uh, program counter. Blah, blah, blah. The only discrete register in the design is the program counter, PC. PC is currently only 10 bits wide. Mm, okay, uh, that's a little short but it could easily expand to any length up to 32 or 36 bits. The memories used for RF, IM, and DM all have registers inside them, so we don't need to provide them. Okay, so RF must be register file, IM is instruction memory, DM is data memory. We do, not, we do need the program counter, since there is no external access to the instruction memory read address. PC is a copy of this register. The memories used for those all have registers inside of them, so we don't need to provide them. And I'm not sure I understand that. Is, there, is it saying that these types of memory, these three types of memory, are just a bunch of registers? I'm a little confused. I'm not sure what that means. The instruction set, figure two, is very simple and regular. All instructions have the same format. Most operations use three register addresses, and most logical and arithmetic instructions are of the form register w. Oh, I was thinking that the R stood for read. I think that's probably register in general. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little confused with the notation up in the block uh, figure. Register w is assigned function of register A, register B. Okay, so we have these two registers. We're doing some operation like an addition or subtraction, or some bit operation, or whatever, logical operation. And the result is assigned to register W. Fine. This seemed easy. OK, so R, A, R, B, and R, W. So if we go back to the block diagram, that must be what's going on. <clears throat> Let's look at this again. OK, so, so with these registers, we have a and B are basically the, the operands to some arithmetic operation, and uh, W is going to be the where those get stored. I see. Okay, okay. So here we have an address 
for A register, the address for B register, the address for where the the um, result should be reg uh, uh, stored. Okay. So let's see. So each of these is a seven bit address if I'm doing my math right. Okay, so 128 different register values. So we have registers zero through 128. And so we have three seven bit uh, register addresses in, that can fit in an instruction, I guess, along with the opcode or whatever. And so here we must have um, some sort of opcode-ish things for the instruction. Okay. All right, that's starting to make some sense. Uh, and then, so for the clock, eh. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm a little confused here. Why is phase one for A and B uh, versus phase zero? I would think that'd be swap, but all right, probably not understanding. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. This seemed easier to explain than a machine that used only one or two register addresses per instruction. It also improves code density and reduces algorithm complexity. If the LC load constant bit is true, the remaining lower bits of the instruction are treated as a 24-bit constant, zero extended, and written to RW. Okay. Any skip or jump is suppressed. I guess skip just skips the next instruction. So for like an if. The, uh, this is for conditional. The in load DM and jump instructions load register W with data from an input device, data from the data memory, uh, wherever part of the data memory is pointed to by register B, or um, the program counter plus one. Okay. All other instructions load register W with the result of some function f called on register a and register b, any instruction except jump conditionally skips the next instruction if the condition implied by the sk, uh, I guess that's the skip field, is true. Okay, the sk field, that must be in the instruction. The store I am, Score, store instruction memory and score, uh, store DM, score, store data memory instructions do data memory or instruction memory pointed to by register B is assigned the value of register A. These instructions also load register W with the arithmetic logic unit result and can be conditionally skip. Uh, Conditionally skipped. I'm a little confused by that. I guess that instruction can be skipped. Mm. The output instruction simply generates a strobe. Okay. A strobe so that we can do something like a write during that clock cycle, I guess. The intent is that RA is output data. You know, register A is output data. Register B is an output device selector, but other arrangements are possible. I see, okay, so so this is if we want to do some sort of output and write it. So generates a strobe uh, during which time the output device can um, <clears throat> see what's uh, what this output data is in register A. And, here is figure two, which is the instruction format. Okay. All 
righty. So we got 31 bits. Let's see. Uh, function. Okay, so what's, what are the parts of it? OP is the operation, or that's like the opcode. Or okay, so I guess I guess the function's also technically part of the opcode, probably. So we have the operation skip. Uh, okay, I see. So this will tell us when we would skip doing that operation um, based on uh, what the ALU is producing or this in ready. Um, signal shift shift is okay I guess is that some sort of bit shift uh, possibility I don't know what RCY is uh, 1 8 and 16 bit shifts okay function okay we have addition subtraction you know, a plus B, A minus B, B plus one, B minus one, A and B, logical and A or B, A X or B, and seven is reserved. Okay. And then the register uh, B, whatever register number that is, register A. What is LC? Uh, I forget what LC is already. Um, and then RW, that's the register we're writing to. And then we have some description here of what these different operators do. Note, if LC, skip and jump are, are suppressed. Okay. What is LC again? Oh, that's load constant. Okay, that's load constant. All right. So operation, these like opcode things, the first three bits or lower lower three bits, normal. Okay, so we have some function f on registers a and b, and then register w gets uh, assigned the value of that function. Skip if condition. Okay, and here uh, the skip tells you when that would happen. Uh, okay, one is store direct memory. Direct memory pointed to by register B is assigned register A's value. Register W is assigned the function F applied to RA and RB, skip if condition. Uh, similar thing here for instruction memory. Out, okay, this is for output. Generate the strobe. Uh, load. Data memory, okay. RB points to an address in data memory that gets written to RW, and then the ALU gets set. Input, RW gets set the input data, ALU gets set. Jump, RW gets assigned the program counter plus one. The program counter gets assigned the function of RA, RB. Okay. And seven is reserved. All right, so that's the instruction format. So we are on page four of eight. I um, think that's enough for now, but that's enough, I think, to get started. I think I'm understanding this uh, architecture a little bit and like the instruction set so forth. It's interesting and I'm curious to see when we get to the Verilog how understandable that is. All right. Well, thank you very much and I'll talk to you soon and we'll keep going and we'll try uh, implementing this. Talk to you later.